What's up, Daw Nation? Here's a quick question for you. Can you successfully market your music through social media? Is it possible? Is it a thing? Huh? Maybe you've tried it before. Maybe you've tried boosting your poster on Facebook or promoting it through Instagram and it just sunk. Is it possible to actually get the results that you want? Is it? Ben? Don't worry, Daw Nation, because we're gonna be answering all of these questions in this week's episode of Behind the Daw with Rave Republic. So with that being said, let's go ahead and cue the unforgettable dark cinematic intro video. Unless you're on podcast, then you don't get that. Let's do it anyways. What's up, Daw Nation? My name is Wyatt Troy. I'm a music producer much like yourself, and I want to welcome you to our Behind the Daw series. Now, if you're new to the series, that's cool. It's fine. It's cool. It's fine. We can deal with that. It is a series where we interview huge music producers, music industry experts, singers, songwriters, sound designers, everyone else in between on an emotional, philosophical, branding, marketing, and overall music business basis so that you can learn from people in the music industry that have already made it and take all their years and years of experience and start applying it to your career today. Like right now, literally right now. So if you wanna keep learning from huge people in the music industry so that you can learn how to get better at music production, learn how to make a bigger impact with your music and how to start making a living off something that you're actually passionate about, then go ahead, right below this video is a little subscribe button. It's waiting for you. Go ahead and click that little subscribe button and the little notification bell so that you'll get notified every single time we put out a new piece of content. Now, if you're listening through the podcast, it's the same concept. Doesn't matter where you are. If you're on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Deezer, doesn't matter wherever you're at, go ahead and just follow the podcast and the same thing will happen. You'll get notified whenever we put out a new piece content. So now the big question is, how is this episode going to benefit you? It's a really great question. So like I mentioned in the beginning, this is with Rave Republic. All right. Now they have had a lot of success. They've had a lot of great things going on for them. They were on the top 100 DJ mag, DJ something or another. Uh, you know what I'm saying? You know what that is. But they were on that. They've, they've toured the world. They've collaborated with absolutely huge people. They've done a lot of cool things. In fact, if you guys ever heard of Procter & Gamble, it's like one of the top Fortune 500 companies. They actually worked for them. They were in the marketing department for them. We're gonna talk about that in this week's episode. So here's four points for you that you can plan to walk away with. Number one, why is music an escape? I mean, no one can deny that, right? You're having a hard day, you need to cope with something. Music helps. Music really, really helps you. It helps you escape normal life, escape your tragedies, ex escape your feelings. It's that, it really is amazing, right? Maybe it doesn't help you escape your feelings. Maybe it actually just helps you learn more about them or see them in the greater plane. The second thing you're gonna learn is avoiding arguments when you're in a duo. This can actually be really beneficial because it's not just when you're in a duo in a music sense. This could be with marriage. This could be with friends. This could be like between me and Ben because me and him argue a lot, right Ben? Still not here. So we're gonna be talking about what are the tactics to avoid arguments and actually to get the right kind of criticism out, how to actually you know, bring up your opinion in the right way so it doesn't offend anybody. We're gonna be talking about it, all right? Third thing that we're gonna be talking about is values versus opinions. What does that mean? What is something that you hold true and what is something that is just your opinion that can be malleable, that you can change, that's just in the box that you carry around? And then the fourth thing that we're gonna be talking about is marketing your music through social media. Is that actually possible? Can you do it? Is there strategies that you can start applying today that will actually promote your music in the right way to the right people at the right time. I'm gonna tell you, that's actually like the bulk of our conversation. Like literally 50% of the episode is us talking about that, which is really cool. Cause again, they were in the marketing team at Procter & Gamble. I'm a big marketing guy, you know, I love marketing. And so we're gonna have a really good conversation about it. Just know that you are going to walk away with some absolute gems in this week's episode. I mean, to be honest, we've been holding on to this episode for months and months and months. It was for a lot of different reasons. And so I'm really freaking excited to get this episode out. So with all that out of the way, Donation, I got one more thing to say. This week's episode of Behind the Dot is sponsored by the Zang Griffin Zodiac Masterclass. Now, what the heck is that? So we over at Donation and Zang Griffin came together and we made this big masterclass he breaks down 14 different songs off his Zodiac album, which went on to get over 100 million streams. So if you want to learn how to make songs that literally went on to get over 100 million streams, then go ahead, click the link below. There'll be one in the description. If you're listening to the podcast and you can't get to those links, head on over to dawnation.net. You can get more information over there, all right? Right now we have the launch discount going on. So it's 50% off right now. So you can go check that out over there. But if you want more information about that, we will be talking about it at the end of the episode. So make sure to stay all the way to the end until I come back on the screen, unless you're listening, at which point you won't be able to really tell that. So just, just listen all the way to the end. That's probably the best course of 
action. Yep, okay, that sounds good. So, Don Nation, I hope you're freaking pumped for this week's episode of Behind the Daw. Let's go ahead and ask our wonderful, apparently assistant video editor, Ben, to introduce us to Rave Republic and to take us behind the Daw. I want to welcome everyone to this week of Behind the Daw. We're with freaking Rave Republic. I'm super stoked, guys. Say what's up to Daw Nation. What's up, Donation? Guys, we're so stoked to have you. But, of course, before we get into it, we need a very hefty, embarrassing story from you guys. Can you deliver on that order? Ooh, tough. So much of our life is clouded in embarrassment. <laughs> Where to begin? You know, we're human beings, so things get embarrassing, and we wouldn't be human if we didn't just, like, have embarrassing things happen to us. Like, we were just in Korea the other day. We had a really cool Airbnb and had this electronic lock. So, you know, you have to get in with a password. So got back trying to get in and Matt was like, we had like two rooms in there. So Matt was fast asleep. I guess so. He's a heavy sleeper, but he can get woken up if you ring the doorbell. But I was trying to figure out how this electronic lock works. I was pretty drunk, I guess, at the time. And I remember this happening, but I, the next thing I know, I'm waking up in a hotel room. So we kind of backtraced my steps and figured out what happened. And then like, I guess I just didn't figure out that you have to put your whole palm over it. And that lets you put in the pin code. Cause I remember the pin code. It was very memorable and easy to do. And all I had to do was just ring the doorbell, but somehow that just didn't cross my mind. So I ended up spending, you know, some hotel room for no reason <laughs> whatsoever when it would have been so easy to get in. But I guess our lives are just punctuated and things like that. So you paid for Airbnb. Yeah. And then you couldn't figure out the locks. You went and got a hotel room. <laughs> and it's just like around the corner. Like I was so confused. I had to like look at my GPS. At first I thought I was waking up in our Airbnb. And I was like, this place looks a bit familiar, but not quiet. But yeah, it turns out that I ruined that night for myself. <laughs> All I needed to do was press the doorbell and everything would have been solved. But actually, no, like uh, there's a more embarrassing story. I think I can tell it. So um, it goes down to hotels. Hotels will be the oh, death yeah. of us. Yeah, <laughs> I am mad knows what I'm going to say. <laughs> Very similar in many ways. <laughs> so we were in China. We played this show in Shanghai, and it was a really sick show. They had a club which has now closed down. What was it called? M2. M2. It's a really dope club. Like the energy just flows into the middle of the dance floor. The crowd is really sick. Like really one of the best shows we played in China. I went back to my hotel, Matt went back to his, and then I just thought it'd be a hilarious idea to prank Matt by knocking on his door naked. <laughs> Had a few drinks. And like, I had my camera with me, you know, I was going to record it. I thought it'd be great content. So I'm like, I'm covering myself and I go to his door and I knock on his door. No answer. Knock again. No answer started ringing his doorbell, no answer. And I go, okay, this prank is not going very well. I'm going back to my room. And I, like, I took the key card from, you know, the, like where you insert the key to get power. Apparently that card is only for power. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like stark naked and there's nothing like to really cover it myself with apart from my Your hand. Phone. My phone. <laughs> like, I'm trying to get into my door nothing is working. <laughs> I'm like panicking going, oh no, what's going on? Then I bring some solutions. I kept going back and forth between my door and his door. He's fast asleep, like he sleeps heavily. So I went to the lift and I was like, all right, I'm just going to go downstairs very quickly. Luckily it was like 5 a.m. So it, it must be quiet. <laughs> Get a replacement key card, all is good. But the lift is one of those glass lifts facing the outside of the building. <laughs> so that was the longest 20 seconds of my life like covering myself facing the street and as soon as the lift doors open the concierge looks at me and i walk over to him and like usain bolt he like sprinted all the way to the machine gave me a duplicate card gave it to me and just said go <laughs> But luckily, I go back to my room safely. So yeah, that it's is two stories for you. <laughs> That's two stories for you. I'm pretty sure I've had nightmares about that kind of stuff before, man. But you actually lived it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, the school story, right? Like when they tell you to be a good public speaker, imagine yourself naked in front of a crowd. But yeah. that happened. Dude. Oh, wait, wait. You picture yourself naked in front of the crowd or you picture the crowd naked? Oh, um, I guess... That's my third embarrassing story now. I was doing it wrong. 
Solid, guys. That was awesome. So <laughs> thank you for shedding that. That helps break the ice so that we can get into the much deeper things that we can talk about now. So, okay, cool. So my first deep question that I have for you, and this is one that this is sincere. I need you to go as deep as possible with this one. This is definitely not a question to be glossed over. We're reaching into the deepest depths of your soul right now. So why music? Why? At the very core of it, I don't want anything like, well, you know, I just, I thought it was cool or anything like that. I want like deep, like why at the core of it all, do you guys do what you do? For me, or well, for us, it's our life. Ever since I was a kid, you know, my parents love music as well. And there's music playing in the house pretty much the whole day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I picked up piano when I was very young. And that was my passion for like a good 10 years. I was playing piano every single day. And that's how I initially got into music. Yeah, like for me, uh, I used to be a P&G, Procter & Gamble, you know, Fortune 500 company. They say nine to five work week, but in reality there, it's like nine till midnight, six days a week. And every hour I had, like I would listen to music uh, ever since I was a kid uh, through my job. It was just something that I was so passionate about. It's just such an amazing escape. And when I realized that eventually I could make it into a career, potentially, it just magnifies the power and intensity of what music can do to your life even more. Ever since then, the motivation is like, don't go back to working insane hours. I mean, we still work long hours, but now it's doing something that you truly feel passionate about, as opposed to like a profit and loss statement. And music just inspires so many people. Like every time we do a sick show, like we realize how much of an impression you can make on someone, how much of a memory you can make on people. And it doesn't matter what show it is, like a huge festival like Ultra or a club show, or even like, I mean, in the past we've done weddings and things, just the memories that you can create for people. And via music. It's yeah, just, via music. It's, yeah. it's crazy. You said something in there that I want to elaborate on, which is it's a beautiful escape. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Like, what do you mean by that it's an escape? Finding escape, it's something that takes you away from your mundane everyday life. It doesn't have to be mundane, of course, but it's just, it's another world. It's another dimension in a way. You look really deep in terms of why people listen to music or why music evolved over time. I mean, even from caveman times and uh, through the continuity of history, it, it has always had that commonality of being truly an escape for people, like just taking them away from their existence and being able to close their eyes and feel like they're somewhere else. I see what you're saying. Do you feel like it helps people escape from this world into a different world? Or do you feel like it helps people escape from this world into a better version of this world? You see what I'm saying? Both, for sure. On one hand, absolutely. Like it's an escape into a better world. Like if you go to raves, it's the same people, but it's a different dynamic just because you are like propelled into a different dimension of it with the same people you know and love. But on the other hand, it can get people to escape. And and you see this, like the music that was born out of big crises from the Holocaust to, you know, different wars, like People always went back to music to live in the world within even their heads. And uh, sometimes a common world shared between people, whether it's soldiers or, you know, or people experiencing something really difficult. So yeah, music is really, really powerful. And just so I know, again, because I can't see you, this is Matt speaking, right? Uh, Stas, Stas, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, how do you say it? Stas, S-T-A-S. Stas, gotcha. Okay, so thank you for that, by the way. That was beautiful. So Matt, I have a question for you then, along the same vein of what we're talking about here. What is a song that you've had throughout your life? Maybe you've created it, maybe you haven't, but it's a song that you cherish. It's to a point where it's like, you know, if it was just to disappear, it didn't exist anymore. And not only would it be sad, it'd be heartbreaking, it'd be soul-wrenching, it'd be like a piece of your soul going away with it. What is a song like that for you? Despacito. <laughs> 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 You're in the right place right now, man. <laughs> Probably like uh, Stevie Wonder's Superstition. You know, every time I hear that song, it just wakes me up. It just gets me going. Uh, it brings so much energy. Uh, if that song was to disappear, you know, uh, I'd lose, I guess, one source of energy. So I think uh, that would be the one song that I really don't want to lose. Gotcha. And it's because of the energy that it brings to you. It's not necessarily tied to any memories. It's because of the energy. Yes, yeah, just the energy. Yeah. No, no particular memories. No. Got it. What about you, Stas? Same question towards you, man. That's a cool question, man. 
It's hard to say it about a song, but I think I have to say it about an artist, in fact, in his body of work. So like Bright Eyes for me. Bright Eyes music, like Conor Oberst, like it was such a big part of me growing up, you know? And he's quite diverse in everything that he's ever done. I mean, um, he's had different side projects and everything. And the lyrics just have so much meaning. And like, I could kind of define my life from the different breakups, different jobs and life decisions that I've made really kind of relate back to some of his music. So I think more than a song, which is just like, you listen to it for during one point of your life and you kind of can repeat it and it means something to you. Like looking at a particular artist and his effects on their entirety of your life, I think is a better example for me. Ah, that's beautiful. In Superstition or in the Bright Eyes song, is there certain lyrics that really resonate with you? For example, do you guys know who Crywolf is? No. You guys would love him. Absolutely love him. In one of his lyrics that absolutely just like resonates with me is he says the term or the phrase, this house has worlds inside its walls. And it alludes to the fact of like all the memories that is created inside of a home, both good and bad. And whenever I just hear that, there's something inside of me that just like opens up and it's just like, oh my gosh, it in and of itself opens a whole world inside of me. So is there lyrics like that for you? I guess it doesn't just necessarily have to be from the Stevie Wonder or the Bright Eyes song. Is there any lyrics that when you hear it like that, it's just like, my gosh, this was like a jigsaw piece to my puzzle of my life. You know what I mean? Is there anything like that for you? Not really. It's just going back to my song. It's just the riff and the melody when it comes in, it's just so positive and happy. And that's what really um, gets me going from the song. Not really the lyrics. Yeah. For me, there's this one track which does something for me. It's a Bright Eyes track called Going for the Gold. And uh, he sings, I know a girl who cries when she practices the violin because each note sounds so pure, it just cuts into her. And then the melody comes pouring out her eyes. And that's a stunning, like, it, poetry, it means a lot. And it's ultimately why we do music, because we want to give people experience and bring emotion to people. So that really encapsulates and um, summarizes why anyone would really get into this field in the first place. Totally. I completely agree. When I was, when I did the interview earlier with Botneck, we had to state a cold hard fact, which for Dot Nation could be a huge mind blowing moment in a good sense. It could be a bad moment in a sense, but basically we had to say, you know, when we're creating music, we're in the business of selling emotion. We're not in the business of selling songs or selling shows. We're selling an experience. We're selling emotions. Can we agree with that? For sure. Yeah, totally. Perfect. Totally switching gears, like throwing a wrench firmly into the machine and switching gears right now. So you guys' name is Rave Republic. Now, there are some people out there who have trouble with the whole concept of a rave. To those people who have trouble with the concept of a rave, what would you guys like to say to those people? So funny story. When we were about to get booked for Vietnam once, um, one of our first overseas shows, we were booked for it. And then they pulled back and said we can't book you because rave means drugs yeah and we were like what <laughs> i mean that's not the uh, meaning behind our name now like honestly like behind rave republic we don't really go after like a purist sense of the word which is like people think of raves as kind of underground parties where they're in a forest or a warehouse or something like that but I mean, for us, ultimately, I mean, a rave is, it goes back to the experience. It's a collaboration of different people coming together. You can in, forget all your problems and exactly. just be in the moment and go crazy and feel the energy. Uh, yeah. yeah. And that's why, I mean, we're called Rave Republic, but we make pop music, we make dance music, we make all genres of music. And it's really, for us, like, the evolved version of rave isn't that like glow stick, um, techno biking kind of a feel. It's, Techno it's Viking. really just that kind of shared experience between people. Techno Viking, that, that got me. That was good. Okay, I see what you're saying though. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what you're saying is that when you guys refer to a rave, it's not necessarily like you're saying like the glow stick, drugged out, whatever, kind of stereotypical definition of rave, but you're more so talking about rave as in the experience where a bunch of people are coming together, partaking of one thing, but having a collective experience with that one thing is that what you're saying exactly nailed it just like a republic as well so that's like a big part of the kind of subtext behind our name so both of those words have a similarity in the way whether you're a country like a republic or you're part of a rave you're ultimately sharing an experience with other people 
that's good to know. I didn't know that. So on the concept of the stereotypical rave, if I was to go over to my neighbor's house and she's I don't know, like 45 years old or something like that, and I was to ask her what a rave is, she'd be like, oh, it's where those punk kids get together and they get all drugged out and you know all that kind of stuff. So to that, how do you guys feel about that stereotypical, I guess, term? I mean, is it kind of like, oh, come on. Why do people got to do that to such a beautiful word? Is that kind of your thoughts or what do you think? You, you can't really blame them, right? Yeah. But that's what they were brought up with. We're not here to kind of change their opinion. You know, we just bring something else to the table, I guess. Yeah, definitely. People have their own definitions yeah. of different words. Um, we don't want to like take away from that. We don't want to challenge the preconceptions at the end of the day. If that's what she feels defines mm-hmm. a rape, it's fair enough. But what we can do is what we can define what we feel uh new age or a modern rave can be we are brought up in singapore uh, (laughs) where this drug culture exists Uh, rave culture really is about just having a really cool time with your friends in a way tell me about that i had no idea so you're saying in singapore the normal north american rave where everyone gets drugged out and listens to electronic music that's not a thing in singapore oh not at all all. (laughs) tell me more i'm really interested about this yeah well uh, singapore like has some of the most harsh i'd say rules especially when it comes to drugs dealing even just a few grams is a death penalty and consuming is obviously highly illegal and you get extremely long jail terms for it yeah so drugs are virtually non-existent yeah it's really like frowned upon it's culturally frowned upon more than even legally and the same exists in a lot of asian countries like korea a k-pop band member was tested positive for some weed And he had to do like a public apology on TV for that. That was a big no-no. So that culture is like, it's very different there in terms of people go to festivals and they genuinely have a good time because of the music. And it's really age specific as well, whereby regardless of your age, you can have an amazing time without any substances. Like we play underage festivals before, we just did like a 17, 18 year old college party and everyone just goes absolutely No alcohol, nothing. Yeah. And of course, like after you turn 18, yeah, people start drinking. And in America, it's 21, I know, <laughs> which is weird for us as well. But yeah, people just manage to have a good time because of the music as opposed to the substances. Okay. So what you're talking about right now is something that I've been like fantasizing about for years because I'm straight edge. I don't do drugs at all. I don't drink at all. I've been sober for 10 years. And with that in mind, morally, most of the time, I can't go to a festival because I'm surrounded by things that I'm tempted to do. And so it actually destroys the experience for me to go there and see everyone all drugged out or drunk or whatever, because I want to go for what we're talking about, the transcendent experience of listening to music with other people who love that music as well. But unfortunately, like really unfortunately, I feel like the festival system, I guess you could say, inside of America has destroyed that. I mean, can we agree with this? It's almost become drugs are the norm at festivals as opposed to them not. Can we agree with that? I, I can't really comment. I yeah. I mean, been to many American festivals. I, I grew up in Australia, you know, and yeah, and drugs are a thing. Even 15, 16, 17 year olds, they go to parties and they take ecstasy. That's true. But it's not the majority. It's not over 50%. It's a big minority. And even if it is a thing, I just feel like it doesn't necessarily matter because people make their own choices. And sure, it might be tempting, but Armin Van Buren said something which was interesting once. Like we were watching him speak in Singapore at a conference called IMS. And he was like, well, drug users are really destroying the scene. You're, you guys are making it hard for everyone who really truly enjoys music. And I, like, to be honest, I disagree because people should be able to make their own choices, especially in countries where the drug laws might be a bit more relaxed. And just because uh, some people are doing a particular thing, whether they're drinking or doing drugs, it doesn't mean that you can't really go to a festival and have an amazing experience because we have a ton of friends who don't drink or don't do anything. Even more friends who never touch drugs or even consider drugs in their life. And they have as amazing and enlightening a time every time they go to a festival because of the way people just come together and have that shared experience as we talked about and you talked about earlier on. And I think that's really the thing, the glue that holds people together as opposed to what people might be on in a festival. 
I want to come on, on that a little bit because I agree with what you're saying, but I think there's some merit to what Armin was saying. Here's why is because I agree with you. I feel like everyone should still have that choice whether to do it or not. That's kind of, in my opinion, a God-given right for you to decide to do that. I'm more talking about it's when people do drugs, drink or whatever, right? They become intoxicated to a point where it starts affecting the quality of time for the other people. Because for example, yes, I agree that Joe can smoke all the weed that he wants, but if he is bugging the crap out of me or harassing me or whatever during a festival, well, then it doesn't matter anymore what Joe decides to do. He's affecting my quality of the experience at that point. And that's what bothers me. And that's kind of been my experience is when I've went to these shows I got drunk girls crawling all over me. I'm married. I don't want anything to do with that. Or I got high people like pit pocketing me and like all that kind of stuff. And maybe I've just been to bad festivals. I don't know. You know what I mean? Maybe, but it affects the quality of the experience. Is this making sense? Yeah, it totally is. To be honest, I personally, like I have this huge belief that no one should really intimidate anyone or everyone should be as happy as they can be by themselves. But at the same time, I mean, even basing it off Singapore, Regardless of whether people drink or not, people can be quite annoying <laughs> in a way. If you feel that because of the substances or something that they're on, they're affecting how much fun you can have. I totally can relate to that. Like we've all seen that, right? You know, that super aggressive drunk guy or something or girl like putting brakes on the festival, whether it's someone who's so drunk, you have to take care of them and take them home, etc. Yeah. So all those experiences definitely exist, but I guess that's kind of part and parcel of the entire festival. And I th think you removed that. It wouldn't be the same experience. It would be like going to a weird cultist meeting where everyone just kind of is on the same page, but that kind of takes away from the fun of it. The ridiculous people that you can meet, like going to Australian festivals where you see someone who's so like, this is an American based podcast. So I'm going to say effed instead of the actual swear word, but seeing someone so effed up that you pull out your video and you recorded it and then you post it on Facebook and then you get a ton of likes and shares because of how like off the wall they are. Like, I think it's part of the experience in a way. I see what you're saying. I completely agree that it doesn't matter if drugs are there or not. There's going to be people that are annoying. There's going to be people there that could potentially affect the quality of the experience. I completely agree with that. I guess where I was coming from with that is that, you know, now I'm kind of thinking about it. I'm not sure how to word it, but you've enlightened me. So this is beautiful where we can kind of debate on a thing. I like doing this. I like to kind of debate on things that I think I know, but maybe I don't. You know what I mean? So it was nice. You handled it good. Thank you. Ruben has some nice podcasts as well, where he's like, we find common ground. That's what we are about as human beings. It's about finding common ground. Even if, if you're straight edge, I drink and get naked and <laughs> get looked at or whatever. I, I mean, we can see the merits of each other's points, but then find common grounds as well as part of it. I agree with that. And actually, that's actually a concept I want to talk about with you two. Has there ever been a time where you guys massively disagreed with each other or, or has it mostly been just like small disagreements or agreements all the way through? You know what I mean? How's that been as a duo? Yeah, we've been super lucky. We've been working now over five years together and yeah. we've never once had an argument. And we're the same, we're very similar viewpoints yeah. uh, in a lot of different topics and uh, especially when it comes to music. So no, we've been lucky and, you know, everything's been smooth sailing so far. Yeah. People have debates, you know, like yeah. what's the best direction for this particular track? Do we like this vocalist? A demo might come in, Matt might like it, I might not, or vice versa. But it's quite easy to sort those problems. And I think when you're working towards a real common goal, when you have a huge passion and you know what the end is, you tend not to disagree. And for both of us also... We started off as friends. Actually, before that, no, we like, well, well I, we, we kind of disliked each other, but we ended up as friends on the back of a bad breakup um, <laughs> that I had. But if you start off as a close friendship and you start a business of that, I feel like it's a lot easier than two super business-minded people coming together yeah, to start definitely. a partnership. It, it's, if you have a lot of commonalities to start with, it tends to kind of perpetuate itself through your business of music. We always get that question and everyone's like, yeah. oh, give us a story. You know, you yeah. must have argued at some point. Like, no, no, we haven't. No, really. <laughs> so let's say it's a hypothetical situation now where you guys massively disagree on something. How would you guys go about it so it wouldn't destroy your relationship? In fact, it would make your relationship better. I think we're both super easygoing. Yeah. And again, like what Stas said, it's about finding a common ground. So I think we'd both kind of accept each other's points and then, you know, go off that. We're very flexible people. So I think... Yeah. 
that that's really helpful, especially when it comes to not disagreeing on different things. Yeah, you just have to see the big picture. People get like a minor argument is like the end of people's relationships. <laughs> you know, uh, they don't see the big picture and things. They tend to nitpick on tiny little areas, but not see the entirety of this relationship and the end goal that you're trying to go towards. So it's weird. People have been like, you should make sure to protect yourselves. What if something happens? What if there's like a wrench that kind of tears Ray Republic apart or something? But it's hard for us to even imagine it just because yeah. we, even though like we get asked that question of one year, two years, and now almost five years of working together. And it's, we've always had the same mindset. It's just, it's been smooth sailing. I see what you're saying. So that is fantastic. And I think, and I've pondered a lot on that question before. It's like, why do so many beautiful relationships fall apart so easily over something that's so minor? I've thought about that a lot. And it came to me one day in the form of a YouTube video, which is amazing. Freaking love YouTube. Anyways, and so you know what what i've come to realize is this is that people's opinions right so you have opinions about things i have opinions about things and so on and so forth think of the opinions as just things that you carry around in a box next to you the opinions aren't you it's just things that you carry around you can switch out your opinions as you desire because they're in the box you're like okay uh, I still feel the same about this opinion, maybe not more about this opinion. This one's a better opinion, so on and so forth, right? But the problem is that most people don't see it as the opinions being in the box. Most people see the opinions as it being themselves. They see the opinions as who they are. And so when someone challenges those opinions, it's no longer challenging the opinion. You're challenging them as a person. You're challenging them as an individual, as the worth of that individual. And that's usually what I found is like when people start to get defensive about that kind of stuff, where it's like, hey, you know, I personally don't feel the same way. Well, what do you mean you don't feel the same way about that? Because you're starting to challenge who they are. And so, and that's where, at least personally, where I found now that I've kind of realized that and realized that my opinions in the box, when someone challenges me, about my opinions, it's like, oh, this might be, you know, okay, well, so let's see what you got to say. This, this this might be pretty good, you know? And so, I mean, how do you guys feel about that? Well, I think that's a really good, yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. And ultimately, if you go even one step up, it goes back to your own sense of ego as well. Yeah. So if you're the kind of individual who really puts his own or her own ego about everything else, it's exactly what you said. It's like your opinions become part of you. It's one and the same thing. So any challenge to that breaks your ego and it like shatters you. But if you're the kind of individual who can just differentiate the two, like I am who I am. Yes, I believe in certain things. Yes, I hold my own certain values. And that's another thing as well, the difference between values and beliefs because values are really bigger things which um, define who you are as a person and, you know, your big thoughts. But your beliefs are things ultimately that could change over time. So if you can differentiate the two and accept that your beliefs can be challenged by someone else and you might occasionally have to compromise on them or sacrifice them or even change them, you're generally just like a happy person and you just work better with other people. I like that, dude. I think that is absolutely fantastic. Guys, we've been going for about 35 minutes on the philosophical side. How about we dive into the music business side? Does that sound pretty good? Sounds good. Yeah. All right. So as far as the music business side, I believe, Matt, you're the one with the MBA, right? We, yeah. Okay. And then Strauss, you're the one that worked for Procter & Gamble, right? Indeed, yes. Perfect. So you guys both have a hefty, I would say, a hefty amount of business knowledge going on behind you, which is freaking amazing. So now I have a question concerning that. I was watching a previous interview that you guys did on It's the Ship, and you mentioned that you did drop quite a bit of money into marketing for your business for a Rave Republic. Can you go over what that kind of looked like? Like what kind of marketing did you guys do? Yeah, we so we spend money in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, as you probably know, you have to spend money now on Facebook and Instagram. So all of our posts need to be boosted in order to reach, you know, X amount of people. Yeah, particularly Facebook, the algorithm is just, yeah. we went like, we were so excited, like our brand was going like crazy organically. We had this gig in the Philippines, I remember at Hive for Halloween. It like queues around the corner, people wanted to see us, we posted a picture, it was just like crazy amount of likes and we we're like, yeah, we got this Facebook thing down pat. And then like the, the in a couple of days, Facebook changed the algorithm and we posted something and it was like, one like we we're like what <laughs> what's going on right here <laughs> something's different and whilst we managed to like go back a little bit 
still, yeah, you got to have this investment. Uh, we also spend money on branding, so on our outfit. So we always wear the same uh, uniform when we DJ, which is a shirt and like a custom-made Red Republic tie. Um, so we spend money on that as well. Then we, we love to give back to our fans or the people yeah. who attend our events. So we spend money on props, on free giveaways. What giveaways do we have? So right? we do have very unique Rave Republic condoms, which are really cool. <laughs> and uh, wristbands as well, which people you know, love. Yeah. There's three ways. What else yeah. do we spend money on? Videos, lyric videos. Yeah, our visuals. Visuals, yeah. We have really sick visuals, I think, that we developed really based on what our brand identity was in the time. Now we take a videographer and photographer with us when we can. It was actually this, and this comes down to something we value, which is giving back to the community that got you where you are. So mm -hmm. for us, that really is Asia and Singapore specifically. Yeah, without them, without Singapore, we wouldn't be where we are today. We, I can't say we discovered, but we we had a message from a photographer slash videographer called YK. You can look him up on Instagram at YK. And he was like, yo, I want to cover you guys for Ultra. Can I slot in? And we had a lot of requests like that, you know. And we checked out his Instagram and his shots. Like there weren't festivals or musicians. There were real people in everyday situations. There were of architecture, travel, and they were absolutely groundbreaking, like beautiful. And straight away we thought, we have something here like let's work with this incredibly talented guy and sure he had struck with some djs as well but we're just absolutely mesmerized by the beauty in his work and to be honest he was bigger than us on instagram he had an insane amount of followers because people saw the quality of his work and was very visual but yeah so like we worked with him straight away we approached him and said let's figure something out let's figure out how we can work together in the long term we can hopefully grow you as well we can introduce you to other contacts we can take you around and if someone like a you know, mine and garrix or whatever ends up hiring you like whatever like yeah. we'd be super happy with that but we really kind of want to enable people to grow and realize their potential as much as they can I love that. So kind of the three main things that I really got from that is that you spent money on social media marketing. So through boosting your posts, you spent money on the branding aspect. So buying the shirts, buying the, the custom main ties. And then the last category was giving back to the fans and all that kind of stuff. So the one that really intrigues me, especially from your guys' background, is the social media marketing part. And so, I mean, from you getting an MBA Matt, and you working at Procter & Gamble stuff. So do you guys have much experience with social media marketing? Uh, for myself, I was kind of trying to lead and pilot a lot of the digital media growth within my category, within Procter & Gamble that I worked with. Like I was a brand manager. And back then, Procter & Gamble wasn't really doing much digital. It was all about traditional TV, etc. So I got a lot of very intimate, close knowledge about that. But the thing about also social media, as you well know, I'm sure, is it changes so rapidly. Yeah. The landscape, the algorithms, the dynamics... So even if I learned something back then, that knowledge can be very much redundant today. So the only, I guess, underlying theme is engagement is always key. Create conversations, create topics, create content for people to really inspire them. But how do you actually get the reach in order to get even your own fans who liked your, um, your page after seeing you at a show and actually like your music? to actually be able to see future communications from you. That's a big thing that I think Facebook has killed, unfortunately. Yeah. They destroyed that, unfortunately, which I mean, from a business aspect, it makes sense because they knew that they could make a lot of money off boost posts and stuff like that. But on the standpoint of like, you know, musicians or podcasters, it's like, bro, like you totally just threw us under like a two ton bus, bro. Like that was not okay. And you know what I mean? And so let me ask you this. So you're saying right now, the question that's kind of floating around in your mind, and it seems like a lot of the people that I have on the show that's been floating around in their mind too, is that they kind of know what's going on with social media, but ultimately they see the potential, but no one really knows how to tap into it for a musician to really know how to, to grow it like furiously. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the easy solution is to create something that goes super viral and then you gain millions of followers or hundreds of thousands of followers. 
Right, right. But the unfortunate thing with creating something viral is the randomness of it, right? There's a lot of hidden variations that we're not entirely sure that we can control in order to create something viral. Can we agree with that? Sure. It might take a thousand attempts, you know, or 10,000. And even, and, and well, on top of that, how split and segregated the social networks are as well nowadays, because there are so many options in different markets. So like, of course, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but in China, we have a ton of other yeah. um, portals. In Indonesia, they still use Path. I don't know if you know about that one. Spotify has become almost its own social network as well. So even though you might get like millions of streams on Spotify, how are, people, how are you going to convert that into another channel like Instagram? So because of how fragmented it is now, it just becomes like another conversation about how you get people into the right funnel after they discover your content. Yeah, you're exactly right. And so really quick, I have something I want to add on to this, but Matt, with you doing your MBA, did you focus at all on social media marketing or was it just traditionally on like business tactics and whatnot? It was all traditional. This was like six years ago, five, six years ago. Uh, unfortunately, it was all traditional. Yeah. Got it. So the reason why that I want to bring this up is this is actually something I'm amazingly passionate about. The two main passions in my life, like outside of my family, is music and digital marketing. I think you were going to say Brave Republic. <laughs> so I have three passions in life. I have. <laughs> <laughs> so if with your permission, I mean, would it be okay to give you guys some social media tips to actually learn how to tackle that monster and, and make it you know, your servant. Would that be okay? Yes, we would love that. Especially if it's about Instagram. Yeah. Um, yeah. For China, like we've recently, we hired an agency because it's its own world. But for the rest of the world, I guess Instagram is still quite important. You're absolutely right. And so I would love to do that for you, especially if it comes to Instagram. Now with me commenting on Instagram, it's important to know that Instagram and Facebook are extremely tied together because, you know, Instagram is owned by Facebook. And so what I'm going to say for Instagram also in some degree applies to Facebook. Okay. Now you're absolutely right. Organic reach on Facebook, literal garbage. I want you to look at the nearest garbage that you have in your room. And that is what Facebook is. Like it is absolutely just stupid. And they gave us the huge middle finger when they cut everyone's organic reach. It was really, really unfortunate for us. But is Facebook useless at this point? Absolutely not. I'm going to get into that in a minute. And it's actually very, very useful. Well, it's still one of the most useful things in the world. But let's talk about Instagram for a second. So how does one grow Instagram? Let me tell you what is not an effective way to grow Instagram. A not effective way is to rely on viral content because what we were talking about earlier, we can't control that. When it comes to marketing, as you both know, control is everything. Power is everything. When you reasonably and effectively rely on something to produce a certain result, right? Can we agree with that? Yeah. Perfect. So the thing is we can't rely on viral content. We can try for it. And if we hit the nail on the head with that high five, let's profit off of it. But it's not something that we should bank on. It's something that we should high five ourselves when it happens. But now what are other things that are good, but not great? Because there's a lot of good things that you can do on Instagram, but there's a lot of better things that you can do on Instagram. And there's even the best things that you can do on Instagram, right? So the good things, let's talk about the good things first. The good things are posting content continually. The good things are posting on stories. The good things are tagging people or going live on Instagram. So let's talk about the best things. If you want the best results, you know, if you're trying, well, first off, let me ask you this before I tell you what the best practices are. What is your main goal with Instagram? Why are you using it in the first place? It's a good question. To be honest, number of followers, like if you had to quantify a specific goal, I think across the board, anyone who says otherwise is <laughs> like, because of bookers, everyone looks at that number. Sure, it might be meaningless, but people do look at it, especially if it's real followers. It's a way of quantifying your success mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah. Okay. So you want to get it for the followers. So if you have a lot of followers, then what? Why is that beneficial? If the algorithm remains as it is, it enables you to engage in conversations with them or by serving your content to them in a memorable way without having to spend a lot of money by um, serving ads to them like you do on Facebook right now. I see. So from what you're saying, from what I understand is if you have a lot of followers on Instagram, the benefit that comes from that is you can immediately tap in and connect with those followers at any given time. It's being able to have that pool of fans to be able to tap into at any given time. Is that what you're saying? I mean, there's two benefits. So firstly that, and it's not immediate, it's not in any given 
time, it's still a percentage of your total reach. And I understand there are, there's an algorithm behind it as well. You can't reach all of your followers immediately, but it gives you a greater chance to create kind of this almost a viral effect without without you know having a viral post whereby if you have a million followers and you post something and lots of people start liking it and it starts serving it to more people you might start landing on the explore tab and generally it kind of multiplies your message to as many people as you can but the second one is really a it people do look at it still in terms of bookers in terms of labels in terms of media in terms of everyone people define or credibility behind this number which might not mean that much which some people might definitely fake yeah but there is a certain sense of credibility because we as human beings really do rely on rankings and results and numbers because there's just so many variations of musicians of businesses that we have to quantify things and one of the ways we do quantify things is by relying on something like an Instagram follower account, unfortunately. You're absolutely right. And what you just said, that's what I was trying to get at, is at the core of it. Most people, when they want to grow an Instagram or a Facebook or a Twitter or whatever, they get caught up in the first step, which is getting followers. And they never fully grasp the second step, which is why do I get these followers in the first place? And what you said was that if you have a lot of followers, number one, you can reach out to them at any given time. And number two, it's going to be easier for you to get booked for shows, which is where you guys make your livelihood, or it's going to be easier to send people to Spotify or some other streaming app so you can make revenue that way, right? So that donation, that is something that we need to think about right now is when you go in, when you are creating anything on social media, remember, Remember that it is a mean to an end, all right? And we need to have that end very, very clearly. For example, within the DAW and behind the DAW, I know exactly why I use social media. It's to drive sales towards our private lessons and our courses. That's exactly why we're using it. And that is the main reason why we do it. So now I want to swing back around. Okay, so if that is the main goal, it's to get booked more, it's to connect with fans, to be able to tap into those fans, you know, at any given time, uh, it's to, get to get more streams. Basically, it's ultimately to make you more profitable, both emotionally and financially as a business, right? That's why we're using social media. So now let's talk about the best practice. The best practice is actually very simple. And it's something that is transcendent of any social platform. What I'm about to say is going to work for Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. It's not that complex. And I'm sure once I explain, you're going to agree with me. But the best practice is through paid traffic, but it's the right kind of paid traffic. And it's to get an action out of that paid traffic. So you mentioned that you boosted a post. I would actually highly encourage you to stop that. The reason why is because if you want to push a post out to someone, it's actually extremely more effective inside of the ads manager of Facebook. You can target more and you get way more analytics of the people that are reacting to it so that you can create more lookalike audiences so that you can push it out to more people that are similar to who's reacting with you. And it's the same on Instagram. Instagram has a promote button. The promote button is basically Instagram's version of the boost post. It's actually incredibly ineffective. What is effective is actually going into the ads manager of Facebook where you can create ads for Instagram and Facebook and hyper-targeting, hyper-targeting the people that are most likely to love you and then calling them to action, which is whether to follow your page or whether to listen to a song or come to a show or whatever like that. And the reason why is this is because once you get into the paid traffic realm, once you get into that, you now have access to anyone on the internet, anyone at all. When you do the boosted posts or when you do, you know, just posting on your page, you are completely confined to the algorithm's mercy at that point. But when you do paid traffic the right way, it opens up everything. And because it opens up everything, then you can hyper target the people that are most likely to love you. Is this making sense so far? Can you elaborate a bit on what you mean by paid traffic? Absolutely. So for example, if we created paid traffic for you guys, it looked like this. So like, for example, let's come up with a goal really quick. What is the main thing that you would want someone to do right now through your Instagram? Would it be to follow you? Would it be to send them to your Spotify? Would it be to you know see you on tour? I mean, what would be the main thing that you would want right now? Yeah, followers. Follow, yeah. Followers. Okay, perfect. So what we would do is we would go into the Facebook ads manager, which is where you create Instagram ads. So you go into there and we would create an ad that is extremely hyper-targeted to the people that are most likely to love you. For example, if I had the choice to show your music to 5,000 people who love Lil Wayne, or if I had the choice to show 5,000 people, or if I had the choice to even just show your music to 100 people, I mean, who would you guys say that you're most like? Martin Garrix. But we do that. We, we target uh, yeah. people who sound like us, or we sound like them. 
I'm going to take a little bit further, but hold on one second. I'm going to finish this thought and I'll, I'll take that a little bit further. But if I had the choice to show you, you know, a huge amount of people that like Lil Wayne, your music, or a small amount of people that like Martin Garrix, your music, I'd take Martin Garrix every time because they're most likely to love you. And now when you use paid traffic, and what I mean by paid traffic is actually creating an ad inside of Facebook Messenger. When you do that, you are now no longer confined to your own followers or to kind of the very small influence that boosting posts and that promoting does. You now have access to everything that Facebook and Instagram has access to. That's over 3 billion people. You see what I'm saying? And so now when we create an ad, ads convert way better than boosted posts or promoting an ad. Are you still with me? Do I need to back up anywhere? Right. So, um, so just to clarify, so you're talking about creating more of something like an awareness campaign, like not boosting a specific post, but creating an ad with, let's say, taking a different key visual or a video and targeting that to a tailor-made like profile of people who would be most likely to be receptive to our messaging. That's exactly what I'm saying. When with boosting posts and with promoting, you are able to target a little bit, a little bit, but you're not able to hyper-target. Then the hyper-targeting is the key to everything that we're talking about right now. For example, when you create a boosted post, who are you targeting right now? You know, are you just targeting people that like Martin Garrix or what exactly are you targeting? I guess it depends on the post. So we primarily try to target more a booster post that we believe we have the best content on. So for example, recently, Jeffrey Satori has played our track at Ultra Miami and like organically it did super, super well, the post anyway, but we wanted to expand the reach even beyond that. Mm -hmm. So we created an ad which was targeted towards people, I think between the ages of 16 to 35, because we know that's our key demographic, didn't target by gender, although our gender tends to skew a tiny bit more male, based on interests of key DJs who we believe we kind of, our follower base is very similar yeah. based on speaking to them. We know what other musicians they like, targeting very specific markets, some which would be lower cost markets, so we can get quite a relatively decent cost per like on them, um, and also markets of strategic expansion. So we're very strong in terms of Asia right now, organically as well, but quite weak in America because we haven't toured in America before. And we know Jeffrey Satorius, for example, Excess Berlin, he has a really big following there as well. So we wanted to serve our ads beyond our traditional markets to some specific cities in America. We didn't want to go all America abroad because I understand someone in Nebraska might be, you know, <laughs> not as likely to listen to that sound as someone in New York City or LA or San Fran, etc. So try to target it like with as many variables as we can. Perfect. And what you're talking about right now, you're on the right train. And I'm just going to push you a little bit further on that right train because you're getting the concept. I wouldn't say you're hyper-targeted yet. I'm saying you're ultra-targeted. Now we're going to go a bit further. And this is where the big argument between boosting posts, promoting posts, and the ads manager comes in. Because boosting posts is exactly what you're saying. Like you can target cities, you can target sex, you can target age, you can target all this kind of stuff. But within the ads manager, this is like you target people who are single, who go to movies on Friday night, who make X amount of money, who, you know what I mean? We're getting to like really nitty gritty details. And when you can get into those really nitty gritty details, it's like you're painting a very, 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 very vivid picture for Facebook or Instagram to be like, that's who you're talking about. Because if you just told me someone who's between the age of 16 and 35 who lives in either Asia or the United States and that listens to Martin Garrix, that is an enormous amount of people. And then that is an enormous amount of variables in there that may convert and that may not. So now when we get into the ads manager, it's like, hey, we're getting nitty gritty now. We're like, we're painting a very vivid picture. There is no room for interpretation here at Facebook. We know exactly who we're talking about. So now when you do that, now when you have that kind of hyper-targeted ad, then you're going to see the conversion rates just rocket launch through the roof because you have the perfect person who loves you now. And then once you have so much data on that, so like I believe with converting people to followers, I think you need about 100. That's about it. And then you can create what's called a lookalike audience. Do you know what a lookalike audience is? No, nope. no. Perfect, guys. Oh my gosh, this is, I'm so excited to tell you about this. So basically it says, okay, we have this data on a hundred people and these hundred people match X, Y, and Z and all the other letters that they match with, right? Okay, they match this age, they match this, they have this in common, so on and so forth. Facebook can then create what's called a lookalike audience, which says, hey, 
By the way, there's also 2 million other people that match this exact same demographic. Would you like to market to them as well? What, would I? Like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> now, you can't do that with a boosted post. You can't. You can't do lookalike audience with a boosted post or a promoted post, but you can with Facebook Ad Manager. You see what I'm saying? You see where I'm going with this? So, for example, I want I'll just to like really hit the nail in the coffin right now. So, recently we released a course. It's called the AU5 Ableton Sound Design course, right? It's like 10 hour course with all kinds of stuff in it about how to make this absolutely insane sound design using only Ableton devices. And so we were using social media to gather leads or to gather people that would be most likely to love it. And so we got a hundred people to buy it. Okay. We got a hundred people to buy it. And then we went back to Facebook and we're like, almighty Facebook, we have this information on these hundred people. And Facebook's like, my dog, I got you. I got millions of people that match these exact people. Would you like me to show them your ad? Would I, Mr. Facebook? Of course, that sounds amazing. But to be honest, we actually don't really run ads on Facebook. We run ads through Instagram. And that's kind of where it gets confusing. When I say Facebook ads, just think of it as both Facebook and Instagram, right? So when it's like that, that is the best way to grow on social media. Because then you can get a very vivid person that the social media is looking out for. And then you can put your content in front of them in such a way that they want to follow you. Because guys, the type of music that you make, if you put it out to the right person, they will be begging to follow you. Like if you're targeting the right person, they'll just be like, I've waited my entire life for people like this, right? And Facebook and Instagram have that information. It's just learning how to get Facebook and Instagram to give you that information. Does that make sense? Is it expensive to target those lookalike people? Absolutely not. Not even kind of. So as of April 25th, 2019, it is not expensive at all. Is this going to be the same price next year? I don't know. It could be a lot more expensive by the time someone's listening to this. It just depends. As far as conversions, I mean, like for the AU5 course, when we were running test ads, we were seeing like 10 cent follows from hyper targeted people. You see what I'm saying? And I mean, depending on where you're at financially, that could be a lot that could not. To me, I'll take that all day. To me, that's like, are you freaking kidding me? 10 cents to find someone who absolutely loves me and is probably going to spend money on me? I'll write that check all day. As far as expensive or like how much money you should be spending on this, start with $5 a day or a dollar a day. You know, like you don't have to spend that much. And then your results will not matter the more that you spend, meaning this. If you spend $5 as opposed to $50, the results should be the same. They should just scale with each other, right? Facebook is not going to reward you because you put more money in. You know what I mean? It's like if you got a 5% return for putting $5 in and then a 20% return for $50 that put in, that doesn't happen. You're going to get 5% return regardless of how much money you put in. So you just start small. If it works good, then you scale that bad boy up and you put more money in and it just grows with it. So just to kind of double click on that, so Spoke Ads Manager create a lookalike audience ideally. Um, what kind of ad would you recommend that we serve in order to convert people to Instagram followers? Such a freaking good question. I applaud you for asking that. So very first off, let's talk about the campaign objective because like when you go in and you're starting to create an ad in the ads manager, it's going to say, what kind of campaign do you want? Do you want an awareness ad? Do you want a conversion ad? Do you want a lead generating ad? So on and so forth, right? There's that little menu that pops up that asks you what you want. When you're starting this off in the middle column, it's the consideration column, right? And in this column, the number one thing that we want to be doing for if we're getting more Instagram followers is traffic. Traffic is the very first step. Traffic is taking cold audiences and converting them to either warm or hot audiences. Now, when I use those terms, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now that's where the traffic will be. The conversions, that's to be used later. Conversions, that's for like retargeting. That's for people who've seen your ad but didn't act on them. So you're retargeting them later and trying to get them back into your ecosystem. So in this specific aspect, we're going to go with traffic because this is going to activate the Facebook algorithms and show it to people that are most likely to be converted to traffic. People are listening and they don't really know what that means. It's a good thing. That's all you need to know. <laughs> so as far as what type of ad that you're going to be running, like we have our objective now, which is traffic, but like what the actual ad will look like, 
basically this is where you need to decide what type of ad you're comfortable running. So for example, there's this guy, his name is Lucidius. He's absolutely amazing. He's a rapper and he does this exact thing that I'm talking about right now. His ads may look different than what your ads look like. By the way, you can spy on anyone's ads that you want to just by going to their Facebook page and on the column on the left, it says info and ads. You can see all the ads that they're running at any time. It's absolutely amazing. So if you went to Lucidius's page, you'll see everything he's doing. But one of his most highly converting ads on there is it's targeted to people who don't know who he is. And it says, would you have gotten in the car? It's a music video and it's about, I think someone got kidnapped or whatever, right? It's very clickbaity, but it works for him. I'm not saying you need to do that. In fact, I wouldn't do that, but it works. So like for you, this is where it kind of comes up to taste. What I would do is I would just create a nice little video. I would connect. Are you guys friends with Martin Garrix? No, no. no. Okay, cool. So I guess this would kind of be for later because one strategy that you could do is, you know, if there's someone that you make music like, you would film a video with them just right off your iPhone. It'd be that person saying, hey, if you love my music, then you got to check out my guy's Rave Republic. And you'd be in the video and they're like, hey, and like their music is amazing. If you love mine, if you love this song by me, you would also love this song by them. Go ahead, swipe up, follow them right now. You will not regret it. You know, like that kind of thing, that's going to be extremely highly converting. If you could do that with Martin Garrix, high freaking five, that's going to be absolutely insane. Another way you could do it is if you love this song, you make a little video. And it's like, if you absolutely love this song by X artist, you'll love this song by us. Swipe up and follow us now to get more music like that. Again, it depends on how clickbaity you want to get with it, how marketer you want to get with it. You can definitely finesse it and make it more poetic if you want to. Like you can make a, a thing. It's like, if you want to listen to music that will absolutely make you feel transcendent at night when the moon is huge, that you can see your freaking shadow, you know, you can make it like that. This is all up to opinion now. This is all up to taste and what fits your brand, right? And so you can do that kind of stuff. But that's what I would do is I would create a video is specifically a story ad. To me, story ads convert better than any other anything besides things on YouTube. YouTube actually converts amazing. But story ads to me converts better than anything right now. And so I would create a story ad video that basically shows why people would love you. You tell them why they would love you, whether it's like the type of feeling that your music brings, or it's someone that they know and love and they're supporting you, or because you create X kind of content or whatever you want to say, right? You tell them why they love you and then you call them to action. Hey, swipe up and follow us. You see what I'm saying? So one thing, the reason we kind of hesitated with those kind of campaigns is we didn't realize, and you're opening up our mind on this, is you can really effectively go off platform because those ads are essentially, we thought, just like purely on Facebook platform to Instagram to create that kind of follower engagement. But it's really interesting that you're saying you can essentially create an Instagram story ad or an ad that pops up on Instagram to get us to follow us via the Facebook ads manager. That's really cool. And in fact, it's even cooler. And I'll tell you why. Like we had a call with Facebook recently. They reached out to us like, yeah, let us help with your campaigns. And of course, I kind of went off with them a little bit about the <laughs> organic reach problems that we're facing and about how they're trying to, whenever you create a Facebook boosted ad, they almost try to by default make your ad serve to Instagram, even if your objective is to create likes on a particular post. And but that's another story. But I was like asking, is there any specific ways that you guys would recommend that we can grow our Instagram follower base? Because we do have a lot of followers through our, all of our shows and through Spotify and all of that, but we're just unable to connect with them on Instagram. And they basically said, nope, stick to Facebook. So, <laughs> so it's really eye-opening that you're saying that. And of course they're going to say that. That's where they make the most money. You know what I mean? Which is stupid because they own Instagram. So they should be like, yeah, go to Instagram. We make money over there too. So yeah, here's how you do it. But yeah, guys, I'm telling you right now, this is someone who's not affiliated with Facebook. I don't get paid by them at all. Well, I mean, I make money through ads because I sell stuff through ads. But you know what I mean? Like I'm, Facebook does not pay me in any way. So this is me just genuinely, you're not hiring me. This is me just genuinely telling you, Instagram is possible through the Facebook managers. Not only is it possible, it's probably the best thing that you can do right now. The second best thing for you guys, just so you know, is YouTube. YouTube, so for example, for how I was saying, like cost per for follow, right? It was like 10 cents, right? It was 10 cents for a person to follow us on 
YouTube, it's like two cents right now. It's like unfreaking believable. YouTube, they did you a solid. They did the opposite of Facebook. They actually helped your organic reach a lot. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's it. Like, to be honest, we kind of, we haven't done anything with YouTube. Like we kind of just occasionally upload videos on there and we just upload stuff and we forget about it, to be honest. Let me help sell you on YouTube even more. Do you know what the biggest search engine in the entire world is? Google. Yeah, good job. It is Google. You know what the second one is? YouTube. Guess who owns YouTube? Google. And so if you want easy access into the biggest search engine in the entire world, which is going to connect you with so many leads, it's ridiculous. If I had to sacrifice all of my social medias except for one, I would keep YouTube by far. Just because, I mean, really the main reason why is because Facebook owns Instagram and Facebook, and I really don't trust Facebook that much. You know what I mean? But YouTube has just been innovative and growing like insanely huge amounts. They literally have more monthly users than Instagram and Facebook combined. Like it's insane. So if I was you, I would be utilizing YouTube like it was going out of style. I would be dumping money into that. That's a completely different conversation. But as far as the information that I brought to you guys tonight, do you feel like it's been useful for you guys? Oh, a million percent. Dude, yeah. Like I can't wait to get started. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay, so let's wrap up the interview and then I got some final words for you. Does that sound good? For sure. Thanks, man. Perfect. Well, guys, dude, this was awesome. I had an amazing time. Did you guys have a good time? Oh, we yeah. Man, it's like, like, to be honest, probably the best interview we've had. Yeah, very unique. It was really cool. Love the philosophical stuff as well. It was a really cool angle. Like we often get the same questions asked. How did you guys meet? Blah, blah, blah. Do you argue? Yeah. <laughs> um, although you did ask that, but, <laughs> but it was like, it was a good twist on it. And yeah, like you added a lot of your own experiences and perspective into everything, which we really appreciate. And of course, the business side as well, you added some fantastic opportunities that we really can't wait to get started on as Matt said. Awesome, guys. Okay, I'm so happy to hear that. Thank you so much for coming on, guys. What's up, Don Nation? Did you enjoy that? Did you learn a lot? Now, don't head out yet because there are still a few things that we need to talk about. But before we talk about those things, make sure to head down, hit the subscribe button and the little notification bell, as well as hitting the like button. I mean, you can hit, you can really hit that as hard as you want. I'm totally fine with that. And also leave a comment below. I'd love to know, did you enjoy this episode? Did you not enjoy this episode? I would love to know if you did or if you didn't. Now, if you're listening to the podcast, again, you can actually just DM me. You can take a screenshot on your phone right now or wherever you're listening to your podcast, send me that screenshot. You can tag me in an Instagram story. I'd love to hear from you over there as well. So now that we got all those things out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about the other things that I feel like are really going to help you on your music journey, all right? Number one is in the doll. What the freak is in the doll? You're behind the doll. There's an in the doll? So right now you are watching an episode of Behind the Dog where we interview music producers, music industry experts, people of that nature on an emotional, philosophical, and, and music business basis, right? So In the Daw focuses more on the technical side, things like sound design, vocal production, mixing, mastering, writing melodies, things of that nature, okay? And we, we invite huge music producers. They come and dissect their songs in real time so you can actually see how famous songs are already made. They're already done. It's really, really cool, okay? And so we've had huge people like Kashmir, Delta Heavy, Mode Set, Fox Evenson, A5, Quick, Set This Guy. There's a whole bunch of people over there, okay? You can find that just on the YouTube channel. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, you can find it over there. You can also find it over on the podcast, okay? Which kind of brings me to my next point. You can partake of this in two different ways. If you want to partake of it on YouTube, you can. If you want to partake of it through the podcast, you can. If you're more of a watcher than a listener, cool. If you're more of a listener than a watcher, no judgment. That's awesome. Which naturally brings me to my next point. If you find this whole idea of In The Daw really cool where you can see huge music producers come and dissect a song that's already been proven to work. If you really wanna see something like that, then guess what? We have this thing called the Zan Griffin Zodiac Masterclass. It's so cool. So Zan Griffin, he made his Zodiac album and it went on to get over a hundred million streams. And Zan, out of the goodness of his heart, wanted to dissect the entire thing, okay? Like literally the entire thing all 14 songs you see how to make everything every sound every kick every snare every melody every everything like everything everything is inside of there there's also bonuses like there's four project files that you can go into there's stems for every song there's bonus presets there's a whole bunch of stuff like that okay so if you're interested in finding out more about that head on over to dawnation.net so you can find that over there it's really really cool right now we're having a 50 percent off sell because it's the launch of the product so if you want to take advantage of that plus all the bonuses i'd highly encourage you to hop on that immediately now if you're wondering well i, I don't even know if this is going to be good i don't know what i can expect from this i don't know if the information is going to be good that's totally fine actually we just released an episode of in the dot with zan griffin and he breaks down his song capricorn which is one of the songs off zodiac so if you kind of want to do a test drive that's totally cool 
go check out the Capricorn Zan Griffin in the dot episode. It's actually the episode that's right before this episode of Behind the Dot. So it's really cool. Also, if you want to get better at sound design, school base still there. If you don't know what that is, that is our sound design course with AU5. He's a huge music producer. You should totally go check him out. But if you want to check out any of these courses, dawnation.net. You can check those things out over there. So again, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Behind the Daw with Rave Republic. And if you did, please like, comment, subscribe, tick the notification bell, repost, follow where, wherever you are, whatever you do, that'd be awesome. It'd really, really help us out. Um, also, feel free to take a screenshot, uh, tag me on an Instagram story, DM me over there. Make sure to tag Rave Republic as well. We'd love to hear from you. So Daw Nation, with that being said, we'll see you back here next week for our new episode of In the Daw with Slippy. There's so much spit. I need water, Ben. Ben!